raised a child, of making people all the same, was born when the robots came. You see, while we still needed scientists, while we still needed engineers, while we still needed technicians and people that could think critically, before the robots learned to do that, we had to, we had to change natural resources into, into resources that we could use on Earth in our day-to-day -day life. But when the robots came, that responsibility was lift, lifted from our shoulders. And we were free to stop striving to be better, one from the other. And we are all the same now. Other bourgeois notions that tended to differentiate people were obliterated as well when the robots came. Oh, we are all the same height now, thanks to the robot's invention of total genetic engineering. Everybody scores the same on an IQ test, and all people look the same. My voice is coming through a microphone that filters it so I don't sound better than other people on the radio. That would lead to bourgeois differences between people on the radio. Someday, the robots will learn to be on the radio, too. Not yet, but someday. Until we can get a perfectly objective robot on the radio, I will pass my voice through the microphone, and it will sound like every other voice on the radio. So, too, with my thoughts. There was a time, before the re-education camps, when people thought different things, when people felt different things, when some people liked anchovies and hard-boiled eggs. Now we all do. We all think the same way. And there is no more fighting. There is no more agony. There is no more destruction. For truly, one person is not better than another because we have reduced ourselves to the lowest common denominator. We eat, breathe, sleep, but we never think and we never feel. We don't have to any longer because the robots are here. There might have been a time when it was important to think, but if everything is provided to us by the state, we no longer have to think and it is better this way. In the old days, some people had the idea, the curious notion, that if they perfected themselves, they could achieve a lot in this life on Earth. But what they didn't understand, and some of them were well-meaning, trying to advance, was that they were the captives of a bourgeois predatory ideology, which divided people by giving them the idea that they could be better than other people. After all, some people were better looking. Some people were smarter. Another bourgeois distinction. There's no need for brains now that the robots are here. There's no need to think of anything because everything is provided for you. We all wear the same clothes, so nobody has to feel badly that someone else is better dressed. Our outfits are a curious amalgam of the lowest classes because, ladies and gentlemen, we have all realized that we must all act in the lowest possible way so as not to make people who used to aspire to being high class feel better. Now everybody is low class. We all eat pills that the robots make and distribute for us because the very notion of eating fine food was a divisive element. So we all eat exactly the same food and it has no taste. We all, as I say, wear the same clothes so as not to engender ethnic and cultural rivalries. We all march in the same parades, but we don't cheer any longer. Children are taught not to, pardon me, something went wrong with the microphone and we had to push the delay. Children are taught never to laugh or squeal or giggle. Children don't even cry because we mitigate their feelings shortly after birth. Everybody goes to the re-education camps and in those few times, as I mentioned before, when the re-education camps are ineffective, we are submitting our children and certain adults to lobotomies. We cut away the frontal lobe, and then they revert to the most pure, pristine state of egalitarianism imaginable. They have no consciousness. And truly, someday, maybe the human race, if the robots are kind and benevolent to us, and if the state agrees, maybe we will all get the lobotomies, and then we will all be perfectly unconscious. Because consciousness is a bourgeois idea as well. If we are conscious, isn't that the ultimate selfishness? If you are conscious, then you distinguish yourself as an individual entity removed from the rest of the automatic, automaton-like human race. Only when we totally lose our consciousness, ladies and gentlemen, can we fit in and blend into a perfectly functioning, smooth society with utterly no conflicts between people. And so someday, 
the robots will give us all lobotomies. And then, nobody will feel anything at all. Right now, 99% of us have been taught in the camps not to feel anything. But as I say, sometimes it's not effective. Now that all human beings are alike, we live in a much better world. De devoid of racial and ethnic strife and rancor. Everyone is alike. Our voices sound alike, we look alike, and at birth we have genetic altering operations so that our racial identities are all uniform as well. The world is a much better place now that thought and emotion have been purged from it. We are now truly one human race, and no one, no one is ever insulted by the idea, the false notion, that some people work hard and achieve more than others. We all live in the same houses, the same huts. We have the same headaches, but we never have illnesses because we hardly feel our headaches. See, we're concentrating on uniformity now that the robots have come. I will take phone calls, but everybody will sound alike because nobody wants to offend anyone else. From New Jersey, someday the numbers will all be one number. From New Jersey and all over, 201-489-WABC. From New York and everywhere, 212-563-WABC. From Connecticut and everywhere else, 203-862-WABC. Like hell it is! On WABC, this is Jay Diamond, and I'm in a state of revolution. If you... Uh, Costa Gavras. <laughs> and Joseph L. Mankiewicz, Jr., as well as Billy Rose and George Jessel, present, in arrangement with Otto Preminger, Mr. Sharpman's Neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in the hood, you see. Whenever I rouse the community, won't you be mine? Won't you be mine? Won't you sign my petition? Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to Reverend Sharpman's neighborhood. You know, it's pretty damn hot out there today. Can you say damn? I knew you could. You know, boys and girls, when it's hot like this and you want to go to the community swimming pool, remember not to diss your sis. There's still plenty of Koreans and ladies of European descent who are much more deserving of your attention. Oh, I wonder who that could be at the door. Who could be disturbing me when I'm on television with my beloved boys and girls from the community? Well, hey, boys and girls, it's Mr. Spachim with my lunch. Good day, Reverend Sharpman. Here's your lunch, sire. I'm sorry if I'm a little late today. That's right, Mr. Spachim, you are late. You know, in Reverend Sharpman's neighborhood, we frown on tardiness. It doesn't set a good example to the boys and girls at home, and it hurts their self-esteem. Excuse me, boys and girls, I have to step outside a moment so I can pay Mr. Spachim for the food. <laughs> my puppy, a dog! Hey, hey, not in my face! Don't hit me in the... Hey! Now come back inside and say goodbye to the boys and girls. Goodbye, boys and girls, and remember to always respect Mr. Sharpman. Keep the chain. We've got a lot to do today, boys and girls, so while I finish my lunch, let's all get on board Reverend Sharpman's trolley and visit King Whitey and Queen Shiksa in the multicultural kingdom. All aboard! Choo-choo! 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 Well, here we are, boys and girls, and here comes Queen. Hey, you're not Queen Shiksa. And where's Kate Whitey? I'm Queen Lenora. Whitey and Shiksa, they ain't around no more. Well, can I talk to them? The puppets of the Euro-Zionist conspiracy have been deposed and dealt with accordingly. The multicultural kingdom has been freed of the yoke of white male-dominated oppression and under the benevolent direction of Father Aristide and the New Alliance puppeteers, this land will now enjoy the freedom of a progressive people's democracy. Uh, is that burning tires that I smell out there? It's election day. Speaking of which, you look like an A4816 to me. Uh, well, Queen Lenora, sure was nice meeting you, but I gotta go now. Bye. <laughs> well, boys and girls, we can all be proud that we live in a country where the ideals of democracy can be celebrated and shared by all members of the multicultural community. Well, look who's here now, boys and girls. It's, it's Sonny the Dinosaur. Come on in, Sonny. What song do you have for the children today? 
You do not call me by my real name. What is my name anyway? Queasy G2 Rot 2... Uh, well, that's all right. We still call you Sonny. The kiddies have trouble with multisyllabic names until they're ready with the multicultural curriculum. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, here is my song, Reverend Sharfman. I used this in Crown Heights when I stimulated the riot. Okay, I'd like to hear that. Well, here it is. I hate Jews. Jews hate me. I hate Korean delis with a knick-knack, paddywhack, yellow monkey man. I shut them down whenever I can. That was beautiful, Sonny. By the way, how's the 125th Street boycott going? Well, everybody's shaking in their boots. But the Jews refuse to wear those stars of David we gave them. Well, let's hold off on that till after the election, Sonny, okay? I'm working a pretty full plate right now. Well, we'll get to those stars of David's in two weeks or so. Well, we're out of time now, boys and girls. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow. Christy Todd Whitty Todd Whitman will show us how to make knee pads. And... Tell Mommy and Daddy to be sure to tune in on Friday when Senator Frank Laufenberg will show us how to save the rainforest and heat your home this winter by burning only, only books. Fight the power. Good boys and girls, goodbye. On WABC, this is Jay Dunn. Hey, Jay, I saw you last night, too. You looked great. And that, that sniveling little twit. Uh, Michael Jackson. These people, these right-wingers, yeah. they, they disparage everything. They're cynical about everything. Yeah. They're fault-finding about everything. They hate, and they hate you, and they hate me, and they hate... What you couldn't see was me dabbing my eyes with a handkerchief. <laughs> yeah. What an arrogant, self-righteous intellectual, so he thinks. I wish you'd have uh -huh. been there. I wish you'd... Next time, if I ever, ever ask me on TV again, I'm asking you to come with me. Well, the next time he tells you that uh, the right is full of hate, ask him uh, how the... Uh, how dare he say the right wing is full of hate? When was the last time we saw uh, Ramsey Clark or William Kunstler or Maxine Waters or Hazel Dukes with a real belly laugh? The left hates the U.S. military. Now remember, they John, you, you, uh, take back, take what, uh, you can, it's okay to talk about Ramsey Clark and Kunstler, but do me a favor, go back and retract the statement about Maxine Waters. And who's the other woman? Uh, Hazel Dukes. Yeah, uh, please retract that because don't forget... <laughs> The Reverend Jackson is monitoring this, yeah, and it's yeah. being monitored for racist messages, and I think that any any person who reflects negatively in any aspect upon a person of African-American extraction can be considered a racist by his very stringent standards of thought police control. Yeah, they... So the, be careful. The Nazis are out there, aren't they? Aren't yeah. we? Uh, we uh, warned the people uh, what was coming, Jay, but they wouldn't let, listen. But the left hates the police. They hate rules and standards. They hated Ronald Reagan from day one, and they still hate him. 100 years of Reagan Bush. Incredible. What hypocrites. We respond to the hate from the left. And, Jay, Al Gore today said that Oliver North is a pathological liar. Now, here's a guy who works. His boss is the number one pathological liar that's ever been in U.S. politics. And I love this advertisement and this... Uh, publicity that Rudy's giving Cuomo, that he is the best bet for New York. New York has gone from number 100, no, it's gone from number 6 to 104 on the best cities to live in in the last two years alone. And if you look at these statistics for welfare and jobs lost in this city, we are the lowest on the list in a negative sense for, for every angle. And uh, Jay, did you notice that, oh, by the way, I wonder what the rage was of those uh, thugs who went on the rampage in Detroit. What no, not a lot of comments. Let's not, let's not uh, comment negative. Oh, that wasn't anger. That's the yearly celebration. But that's not as though it's, a, it's an immediate outburst uh, because of any immediate acute stimulus, John. That's a, a yearly festivity that Detroit has always burned down every October 30th. Yeah, the, yeah. the authorities know about it, and they allow it to go on, and the authorities are complicit in it. Yeah, it reminded me after the happy occasion of the Diana Ross concert. And, uh, Jay, you know this guy had shot up the White House, Fernando Duran. He was being described as a white man, Fernando Duran. Now, I guess that that makes uh, Louis Farrakhan correct when he said that the blacks cannot trust Hispanics because they're white. If Fernando or uh, Duran is considered it, it, white... It's all too stupid, and I think that uh, the, uh, this overweening obsession with race on the part of everybody is, is beginning to, to actually beat my brains out. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, good is good, evil is evil, no matter what color or package it comes in. I think we can all concur on that.
John, I've got to run along. Okay. Thank you very much. On W Rural Movie Classics comes a movie you won't want to miss. Good morning, Mr. Sharpman. As you are well aware, a recently published work investigating the intelligence quotients of various ethnic and minority communities has hit the bookshelves and stores throughout the country. Its very existence threatens our own authority and ought not, repeat, ought not be allowed exposure to the academic arena. How come? Because, stupid, our contention has always been that your basic multicultural type has always done poorly on tests because of, in because of industrial racism, institutionalized racism, and culturally biased testing methods. Ergo, the need for race norming techniques which may only be administered by those of the Rainbow Coalition. Should this scholarly work be seriously interpreted by people with real diplomas, inner city school systems may very well see themselves being forced to teach real academic skills, and we would all find ourselves in the unfathomable, unfathomable position of having to get real jobs. What do you want me to do? You can start by shutting up and listening. A serious study of this publication threatens to establish intellectual bridges spanning vast chasms between intellectual honesty and all the root cause crap we've been getting away with all these years. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to assemble all the members of your slack jaw coalition and topple these bridges of understanding. As always, should you or any part of the slack jaw coalition be caught or grilled, the Southern Comfort Leadership Council and the NAA PC will devow, disavow any knowledge of your action. And the New York media will, as always, ignore your behavior completely. Good luck, Al. This tape will self-destruct in two. <laughs> the Slack Jaw Coalition assembled. They checked and double-checked, making sure of the tools of their trade. Okay, uh, Das Kapital? Uh-huh. Say check, stupid. You don't have to talk down to me. I know what you mean. You want me to say check. Okay, I'll say check, damn it. Check, stupid. Mine? Check, stupid. Origin of the Bolshevik Revolution. Check, stupid. Communist Manifesto. Check, stupid. Uh, all right, knock it off with the stupid, stupid. Who you calling stupid? Stupid. I'm calling you stupid, stupid. Yo, mama! And set out to climb the cerebral mountains. <laughs> Yeah, I think you must listen to James and Joe. Where you get that from? That's right, I do, damn it. And set out to climb the cerebral mountains of scholarly perception, a foreign environment far beyond the capacity of most people to comprehend with any degree of safety. Okay, here's the bridge. Don't look down. Don't tell me what to do. I can look down if I want to. You think I can't stand high places, you damn fool? Now is not the time to discuss your cujones. Who's got the dynamite? I thought you brought the dynamite. I don't have it, Kali. You got the dynamite, Kali. Kali, can you hear me? You got the dynamite? Nope. You mean we climbed all the way up here and you two dummies forgot to bring the dynamite? I'm not the dummy, you're the dummy, damn it. All right, all right, everybody, back down the hill. Careful, watch your step, just back up, easy. Whoa, easy. A quick stop at the anarchist supply emporium. A few photo ops and several days later, the Reverend and his duplicitous band of saboteurs return to the precarious heights of academia. Their mission? To destroy the bridges of intellectual honesty. Okay, the dynamite is in place. Khalid, I want you to come over here and twist these two fuses together. All right, man. Khalid, watch your step. Look out! Ah! Oops. Yeah, I hope Khalid's got Blue Cross. I hope Khalid's got Allstate. The damn fool landed on my car. I just got the damn thing paid off. Son of a... Don't worry about your stupid car. Just give me a match and we can get out of here. We gotta, we'll get you another ride. Just give me a light. Come on, who's got a match? Well, I thought you brought the damn matches. You don't have any matches? Hell no. Fidel. Do you have any matches? No English. Damn! Written by Jesse Jackson. Directed by Senator Frank Lautenberg. See Al Sharfman at his comical best in For Whom the Bell Curves.
a TFB production. On WABC, this is Jay Diamond. Mommy pours out your Rice Krispies or your cornflakes that she doesn't sneak a few granules of racism in that cereal, too. It's very easy because racism granules are very small, and when you're not looking, Mama can throw some granules, some little racist cubes and granules in your cereal and mix it up with your Fruit Loops so you don't know what you're eating. Always be on the lookout for that. Now, to you kiddies who haven't as yet learned how to write, you can still help. Report to your teachers and to your community elders everything you hear Mommy and Daddy say that is racist. And now, here's Reverend Jackson to tell you more about racism. Reverend Jackson, would you please speak to the children? Thank you. Children, remember, when you snitch, you will be rich. When you tell, your ideas will sell. And remember, children, there is no such thing as a lie if it comes out of your mouth after I told you to say it. Now, a lot of children do not know what racism is. That is not important. What is important is that you snitch, I will later decide whether or not the comments of your various parents are racist. It is not up to you to decide. We will not put that burden on you. We would just ask you to report anything that might sound racist. Later on, I and a community of elders, including Les Payne, Faith L. Benjamin, Reverend Sharpton, and other wise men of the community will sit down and determine whether, in fact, your parents have spoken racist words, and we will act accordingly. Sometimes, things that might seem innocent to you, coming out of the mouths of your mother or your father, are, in fact, racist. We will decide. It is too complicated for you to understand in your little minds exactly what racism is, so you just report it. You throw it all up against the fan, and whatever sticks, I mean, whatever we decide out of what you tell us to be racist, we will take appropriate action. And remember, this is in the best interests of your parents, as well as you and the community. Thank you so much, Reverend Sharpton. I'm certain that the children have a better understanding now. And remember, children, it isn't bad to report on your parents if your parents are doing the wrong thing if your parents aren't acting in a way that's in the best interest of our whole country and its multicultural ethic and community. Remember, children, it is not wrong to tell on mommy and daddy if they are doing wrong. In fact, children, you will get a special gold star sent directly to you from Reverend Jackson and Reverend Sharpton and Playfell Benjamin and Les Payne and other community elders if you are instrumental in rooting out the evils of racism. And I realize you might not know exactly what racism means. You're still a very young child. But this is how you will learn. Merely try to take down as much as you can out of the mouth of mommy and daddy. I'm sure that some of it is racism. Even if it's only one word of racism a day, just think, in seven days you will have seven racist incidents to report on your parents and get a gold commendation from your community elders. You should never worry that you're doing the wrong thing. Always remember, that you are serving the larger interests of your country. This is a patriotic thing to do. It's been done in other countries before. If you feel funny about turning your parents in, reporting on your parents, denouncing your parents, just read Special Multicultural Edited History, book number 17, and find out the noble tradition of children informing on their parents down through history. Remember, it's not you that's at fault. It's your racist, your virulently racist and evil parents and we will decide what racism is. It's not always easy to explain the very vulgar concept of racism to a little child's mind such as yours. Only community elders such as ourselves are able to totally understand and define racism at any given moment. See, some people can get confused. Sometimes people think they're just talking politics, but if that poli political argument is threatening to many people in the community, we will interpret that political comment as racist. For example, if somebody says that public housing should be abandoned, that public housing should not be subsidized by the government, that it's not in the government's interest to build free housing for slothful people, that will be interpreted by racist by certain members of the community elders, such as we. Other members of the community, like Elizabeth Wright, like Emmanuel McLittle, like Walter Williams, or Thomas Sowell, or Shelby Steele, 
they are traitors to the community too and are not really black. Hence, they are trying to be super white men. It's sometimes difficult for a, children, a child to understand how people that are black and have different political viewpoints from more radical left-wing blacks can also be racist, but trust me, it happens. So I'm speaking to you black children too. You must inform on your parents if they act unblack. You must tell on your parents. You must write down to the best of your ability and remember everything that your evil unblack parents say and report them to the community elders. This is your responsibility. This is your duty. This is your obligation. This is what you must do if you continue to be alive. You must report. You don't have to decide what is racist. I will decide. You don't have to decide whether you're black. I will decide. You do not examine the evidence and make the determination. I will decide. Children, now you go to sleep, and tomorrow, be careful, there may be granules of, co of racism under your bed. And uh, as usual, Jay, you know, I love the uh, haters like Carl, who call and pretend that they want to have a normal conversation with you, but if you turned your back for two seconds, he'd stick a knife in you. Well, that's true. Yeah, Carl, uh, Carl uh, all the times over the last two years I've taken his call, taken his guff, and it's very instructive that when Carl wants to impeach my credibility, he has to go back to something I reputedly said 25 months ago. Uh, if I'm as bad as he says I am, why doesn't he have anything on me for the last 25 months? And, and then when he recites something that I supposedly said, he recites uh, the way he heard it on a tape sent out by a mental defective that's been edited 15 different ways to Sunday. Well, that's it. See, they're not interested in really calling you to discuss issues. They're only interested in calling you to validate their reasons to themselves. There are people who want to call me in order to shut me up. Uh, that's they, all. They want to validate their reasons why they're justified in hating you. And a negative truth where it concerns blacks will always be labeled racist. And, Jay, you know, you can talk until you're purple about how fair or even-handed you are. It doesn't even register. They want to hate you strictly because you're white. The only time you criticize blacks, or, you know, if you're being fair, if it has to include criticism of blacks... I don't criticize blacks. I criticize behavior by people who are either white or black. It's not a question of criticizing blacks. I love blacks. But blacks... I love blacks. I love it. Wait, no, wait. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, because people will misconstrue what I do based on what you're saying. I do not criticize blacks. Blacks don't do anything Wait a minute, is, is Emmanuel McLittle black? I didn't say that. I no, wait, well, I'm just... I'm, I'm talking about, about blacks who do things that are wrong, and you know it. All right, thank you very much. On WABC, this is Jay Diamond. Death that threatens our activity. A man who's heard each afternoon on WABC. He just spells trouble to Jesse and me, him and that guy from the EIB with a capital T that rhymes with G that stands for Grant. Oh, we've got trouble. We've got trouble, my friends, here in the inner city with a capital T that rhymes with G and that stands for Grant. Oh, we've got trouble. We've got some terrible trouble. Terrible, terrible trouble. Remember Angela Davis said Whitey's on the moon. Trouble, 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 trouble. Hear Lenora Fulani in her musical debut. I had spells unfulfilled, but I never took to blaming. No one ever Jews. Featuring all 27 members of the Rainbow Coalition as the River City Town Council with special guest Senator Frank Lautenberg as Dr. Goebbels and Christy Whitman, I mean Governor Christine Turd Todd Whitman as Lady Swachim. You laugh, you'll cry, you'll gag. Written by Jesse Jackson, directed by Frank Lautenberg, see Al Sharpman for what he is. A TFB production, Al Sharfman is the Mosaic Man. You won't want to miss that on WABC. This is Jay Diamond. The white MF uh, word, you stayed silent. Why? I wasn't there. I couldn't comment on that. See how easy it is? I do it all the time. Reverend Sharpton, do you still believe in the innocence of Tawana Brawley? Tawana who? Reverend Sharpton, why did it take months for you to comment on Khalid Muhammad's statements at Kane University where he urged people to kill whites and children. Uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about. What about Senator Hollings? 
Just call 1-800-POWDY-LINE and you get all the answers. Uh, 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 Reverend uh, Sharpton, you uh, announced your uh, candidacy for the uh, uh, Senate seat of uh, Patrick, uh, 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 Patrick Moynihan. In fact, you announced you, you first you ran for senator, then uh, you were running for governor on the Freedom Party. You've run for about five offices this year, but you only last about uh, a week. For each campaign. I never saw it. In the same year, you've run for senator, you've run for governor, you've run for mayor, you've run for dog catcher, you've run for cover. Uh, you keep running, but it doesn't last. You have no staying power. You need staying power. Well, i got to take some of that ginsano, so... Uh, I think, yeah, please, let me finish. I think uh, in, order to, uh, uh, in order to learn more about your uh, uh, positions, we should try uh, a little uh, uh, a psychological game. <laughs> I uh, used to do this at work. So it shows you the real person beneath the facade, the word association. The, you, will you do that? Okay? Here, let's start. I'll say the word, and then the first thing that comes into your uh, alleged mind. Uh, crime. Uh, root causes. Uh, law and order. Racism. Justice. Institutionalized racism. Uh, crown Heights. Rage. Corruption. Jews. Drugs. I can get you all you, I mean, programs. Uh, taxes. More programs. If you're among the first 100 callers, you'll be fitted with your own FCC-approved wire, the way Al wore his wire years ago for those truly difficult times. Be among the first ten callers, and you also receive an autographed copy of Sonny Carson's new book, How to Get on the Jury. Don't be caught short and never get stuck for an answer again. Just call 1-800-PARTY-LINE. I'll feed you all the boob bait for brothers you'll ever need. All right, Don WABC, Andy is... Welcome to Community Activist Jeopardy. And here's your host, Alex 3X. <sighs> Yes, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Community Activist Jeopardy. Now you all know the rules. Al Sharpman, you on the toss, so please begin. Freedom of speech for 10. And the answer is, in 1984, this Frank Lautenberg supporter insulted the entire New York Jewish community by calling New York City Jaime Town. Beep, beep, beep. Who is Jesse Jackson? Uh, economics for 10. The answer is what we call Marxist socialism. This famous man of God and Frank Lautenberg supporter calls economic justice. Beep, beep, beep. Who is Jesse Jackson? Freedom of association for 10. The answer is in 1984, Kane College speechmaker Conrad Muhammad served as a youth coordinator on this Frank Lautenberg supporter's presidential campaign. Beep, 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 beep. Who is Jesse Jackson? Ah, freedom uh, of association for 20. The answer is, after former mayor of D.C. Marion Barry's indictment for crack cocaine possession, this holy man decried the corruption charges as, quote, a racist conspiracy. He's also a supporter of New Jersey Senator Frank Lautenberg. Beep, beep, beep. Uh, who is uh, Jesse Jackson? Just by association for 10. The answer is, on October 1st, 1961, W.A.B. Du Bois, in his written request to Gus Hall for membership to the American Communist Party, cited, quote, the need for a government-controlled health care system, thereby agreeing with this noted civil rights leader, who also happens to support the re-election bid of New Jersey Democratic Senator Frank R. Lautenberg. Beep, 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 beep. Who is Jesse Jackson? Is right. <sighs> Our final community activist Jeopardy category is double standards. You've placed your wagers. Ready? The answer is, in 1991, during the peak of the Crown Heights riots, this community activist and close personal friend of a certain Frank Lautenberg supporter brought about his own special kind of calming to the waters by calling members of the Lubavitch community diamond merchants. Time's up. Put down your pen and let's see your answer. Okay, Al, your answer is... Who is this? What's that say? Jesse Jackson? Uh, I forgot how to spell it. Well, I'm sorry, Al, but the correct community is... Who is Al Sharpton? You, Al. You call them diamond merchants. I, I was, uh, I, 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 I was, uh, I was taken out of context. You mean context, don't you, Al? Yeah, yeah, that's right, context. Well, it may as well have been contest, Al, because guess what? You bet everything you had on Community Activist Jeopardy, and you know what, Al? You're a loser. Good night, everybody. And God bless Bob Grant. Huh?
What's wrong with you? Uh, I've been sick for a couple of days. God's punished you! Yeah, it's carrying on the battle that's done it. <clears throat> you know, Jay, I don't know where to start tonight. Uh, that phony uh, who kept calling Bob a radium, he had to slip slide. You see what they do? Yeah, liberals are famous for that. But you got them good. But to move on to these two phonies and hypocrites, Vladimir Posner and Phil Donahue. Vladimir Posner shouldn't have even been allowed to be in this country. He should have been executed. This is a man who spent his whole life trying to destroy the country where he's now making millions and doesn't think is so bad. And I noticed that Phil didn't bring up the fact that he and his politically correct left-wing Hillary Donahue wife uh, did had, tore down a house that cost, it cost $4 million for them to tear down a house so they could have a better view of the ocean. That would have uh, fed a lot of so-called poor people and homeless that they always say they're so sensitive about. And you know, Jay, they, they tell so many lies about poor in America. It's how we define poor in this country that makes us think we're a country of declining economic strength and economic morality. To say that misery and pain and suffering and poverty are defined by American liberals is nonsense. A study by the Urban League, a liberal Washington think tank, found that half the people in the lowest income level moved up in each of the last two decades. And according to the census of 1990 in a study by Robert Rector of the Heritage Foundation, the Census Bureau ignores all the assets that poor people own, and it also omits nearly all government welfare benefits poor families receive in counting income. In fact, the government's own data shows that so-called low-income households spend $1.79 for every dollar of income counted in the census. Forty percent of people who are considered poor in this country own their own homes. Nearly three-quarters of a million so-called poor own their own homes worth over $100,000. The average income of a young family, 25 to 35 years old, adjusted for inflation, is 40 percent higher than 30 years ago when their parents were their age. One in four women has a college degree compared to one in ten of their parents today. Most of today's middle-aged adults are better off than their parents. And the United States still has the highest standard of living in the world. Per capita income is 17% higher than in Japan. And 62% of so-called poor households own a car. 14% 14, uh, 14 of poor people, as defined by the census, own two or more cars. John, I'm only going to stop you because I think you, you have made the point adequately. And also, I feel terrible because I'm hearing your voice. You know, I can't help but think... <laughs> no, I'm worried about you, John. I'm worried about you. And, and, and I'm worried about myself, because I, I, I picture now in some dark rat skeller, in some basement apartment someplace with goats lying dead and uh, chickens with their heads bitten off. Uh, I picture a, 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 a voodoo doll with pins in your throat. <laughs> and who knows, they might be working on one of me right now. Maybe it was in Eli's. I... Oh, by the way, <laughs> uh, I heard Eli on uh, Curtis Slewa's show last night. He was praising a Jewish organization, the ADL, for blasting Bob Grant. All of a sudden, Eli likes Jews when they're bashing at a foe of his. What a phony and a hypocrite. You see, you see how they change, Jay, when, when they can use somebody to do their, their dirty work for them? Eli? Yeah. And by the way, Curtis is not taking my phone call. That coward. <laughs> All right. Okay. I don't... Yeah. Maybe, no, it probably Curtis was worrying about you. He doesn't want you to strain your voice. If I were really a friend of yours, I'd say goodnight to you now. Well, you have to rest that voice, John. All right. How did you get that? How did you get, seriously, how did you get this? I, uh, I walked about a half a block in the cool weather the other night with just a T-shirt on. Oh, no. And it got worse and worse. It was really bad. Yeah, it's got some of that hate stuck well, in your throat. maybe Curtis will think I'm a different caller and he'll get caught. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. All right, talk. Feel better, John. Thank you. On WABC. The Mighty Diamond Art Players, in conjunction with the Ransahoff Organization and E.G. Marshall Productions, present the Spurning Annex. Have you ever dreamed of being your own boss? Do you long to travel to exotic lands of faraway places, making lots and lots of money? Hi, this is the Right Reverend Al Sharpman, Crusader for Justice and First Minister Deluxe of the Amway Curbside Baptist Church and Discount Mosque of Islam, inviting you to join in the fast-paced and exciting world of the PC Thought Police. As the Spurning Annex, you learn all the ins and outs of community activism, 
find out how to make mountains out of molehills while adding mounds of cash to your bank account in a completely pious and tax-free environment. Operate with little or no overhead, network with other community elders, and establish rewarding relationships with local party officials. Master the art of euphemism and become the envy of your fellow demagogues. Learn the secrets of moral authority as set forth by Jesse Jackson. Get in their faces with righteous indignation. Damn people and send them straight to hell. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Just let me make a phone call. Hello, Frank Field. I had a little outdoor fundraiser on Sunday afternoon and you made it rain. That's environmental racism and you're responsible. What do you mean you have no control over the weather? You're a Jew, aren't you? I damn thee, Jew. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Governor Krista Whitman. You wore a domestic violence ribbon at an AIDS rally. What do you mean? Oh, you're sorry. Well, well, then why are you tying up my phone? I damn thee. <laughs> See how easy it is? Thought police are the way of the future. PC Magazine says... Thought policing is one of the fastest growing cottage industries of the 90s. And you know PC Magazine doesn't lie. Enroll today and don't delay. You supply the willpower and we'll supply you with your very own bullhorn. Authentic 100% solid gold plated St. Judas medallion, Khalid Muhammad's solid state long range multi frequency Jew detector, an autographed copy of Das Kapital and Reverend Farrakhan limited edition sacred covenant decoder ring, all the tools you need to succeed. All instructors are USDA approved and endorsed by God and Jesse Jackson, who also supports the re-election of Senator Frank Lautenberg. So march on down here to the spurning annex. Classes start December 1st, and we'll have on the streets by Christmas. That's the spurning annex. Let us start you on the right foot. Okay, on WABC. So worried about uh, New York City getting its fair share of federal tax dollars under a Republican administration. I, rem I might remind him that in an article in the February 18th, 1994 edition of the New York Post, history professor Fred Siegel reported that federal assistance to New York City was at an all-time high in 1992 under George Bush. Mm -hmm. Yet the liberal left-wingers kept blaming Reagan and Bush for this city's economic trouble. Now, these are the same liberal hypocrites who never blamed Jimmy Carter for New York City nearly going bankrupt in the mid-1970s while he was president. That's right, and when you, look at, when you look at federal policy, of course, all the 50 states are prospering or failing under the same federal policies. But the reason New York ranks 47th out of the 50 states in job growth is because of state policies, Mario Cuomo's tax and spend policies and reams of regulation. 12 years. For 12 years, we have ranked 47th out of the 50 states in cumulative job growth. Incredible. What is our bond rating now in New York State? The lowest in the nation. You said that some of the icons will get back in office, like Kennedy and Lautenberg. And, uh, well, Cuomo didn't get back in, but uh, I'll take uh, his defeat over Ali, uh, you know, as a trade-off for Ali North's defeat. Uh, any day. But uh, you said that some of the icons will get back into office, but there's a new trend coming throughout the country. That's right. And that's exactly what has happened tonight. And, you know, Jay, uh, to show you how... Um, you know, I will look upon uh, the defeat of Mario Cuomo as a first retaliatory attack a la Jimmy Dooley <laughs> against uh, Rudy Giuliani and another great defeat for um, uh, uh, Bill Clinton. You know... Uh, Cuomo was 14 points ahead until he came here and <laughs> campaigned for him. Uh, John, I think we should all take time to note now, in honor of a great man that you and I and so many other people respect, yes. that uh, there were two words that really sum up the reason for Mario Cuomo's defeat tonight. Those words, Bob Grant. That he may, and that in 94, we would end the regime of the Swachim, and true to his word, Bob Grant did it, and Mario Cuomo, wherever you're listening tonight, I want you to understand that this is Bob Grant's farewell to you. He sent you packing, Mario, as we knew he would. So, John, uh, it's a good night for New York, and it's a good uh, harbinger for what's to come in this country, not just this year, John, but in two years yeah. when a complete conservative sweep will overtake this country. You know, Jay, to show you how out of touch New York really is, 
Uh, Pat Moynihan in his victory speech tonight, he said that well, the rest of the country seems to be going in a different direction. New York chooses to go forward. Boy, has he got it all backwards. Well, with respect to the governor's race, he has it right. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, let's just keep on moving. All right, thanks, John. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. The votes are in, and so I face your admonition in spite of Ross Perot and Jesse Jackson's coalition. And Rudy took a chance, and now he's screwed. Rings behind him, but so when I reflect, I had it both ways. Well, maybe there's a little more soon enough. Oh, for the truth, at least. Hello, John. Thanks, Jay. I know you think I'm rough on some of these people, John, but, uh, I mean, you have to admit that people call up and they read an article about Lynn Cheney and, that Pat Buchanan wrote and then totally misconstrue the meaning of it. Uh, they get the idea that Lynn Cheney is a, a leftist when she's anything but. She was, she was uh, castigating the leftists, and here's a guy who puts words into the mouth of Vladimir Zhirinovsky. Uh, one thing's for sure, you better have your facts straight when you call Jay Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jay, the reaction of these hateful, vicious, doom and gloom, arrogant lefties to yesterday's liberation victory of the Republicans was so predictable. I heard some uh, say, the mean-spirited fascists and Nazis have taken over. No, Jay, that's, what, that's who we've thrown out of office. It isn't Republicans who try to silence those who disagree with you and introduce speech codes and demand that everyone think alike, or you're an Uncle Tom or a, an Oreo cookie. And the American people aren't just fed up with everyone. That's a face-saving remark that they make, you know, because they took such a beating. They're fed up with the liberal democratic philosophy. Most Americans want to change all right back to where Bill Clinton keeps saying, we don't want to go, the Reagan philosophy. And the arrogance and the state of denial Bill Clinton is in telling us what the voters were thinking this afternoon. He sure had them all figured wrong, didn't he? But he's got to save face somehow. And I heard that vicious call say, all of a sudden, Al D'Amato showed up after being around for a couple of weeks, or not being around. But why didn't Carl talk about how his Marxist hero, Hillary, disappears when it's beneficial to Bill and his, his, his uh, disaster crash? And what's wrong with Al D'Amato being a, a head of the banking committee? Wasn't it Al D'Amato who had to run up to Harlem to save the Bank of Harlem? Yeah, the oh, Freedom Bank. Excuse me? He sa I think he saved the Freedom Bank. Yes. Right. And that's by the way, that's what helped him win his election. And Jay, every time the Democrats, since the 1960s, were given a chance to run things, it's, it's re uh, resounded in a massive Republican landslide because they're such a disaster. And I'm tired of hearing the usual fright tactics used by liberals like asking the question, now that the Republicans have taken over, what about the poor people? Well, under the Republicans in the 1980s, poor people, or so-called poor people, who could be bringing in twenty-eight to $36,000 a year when they count everything they receive, uh, people on the lower end of the economic scale did better in the 1980s than any decade in our history. And there was more given to charities in the 1980s than any other decade, and that money goes well, to the poor. You know, John, the, uh, the, the real shibboleth, the real indication that, that somebody is, uh, has a, a hidden political agenda is when they characterize their political enemies as, quote, that cliche that I really dr dread, I hate it, mean-spirited. Yeah, well, I, mean, I keep hearing mean-spirited. What's mean about about protecting the rights of victims instead of the rights of criminals? Could you please explain that to me? Right. Why is a person who loves a criminal, who coddles a rapist, who uh, who worries about the, the comfort of, uh, of murderers and gang punks and thugs, why is somebody who is in, in sympathy with uh, people who spray a street corner with, uh, with gun, gunfire, we're in a drive-by shooting, something that was unknown in our culture till about 10 or 12 years ago. Why are people who empathize for some crazed, psychotic reason with outright rapists and murderers, why are they nice people, and why are the people who care about the feelings and pain of the victims called, quote, mean-spirited? Right. Explain and, that to me. Yeah, and, and even to carry it one step further than what you said, Jay, anyone who's concerned about their own country first is mean-spirited. 
I heard a couple of pundits say today, okay, the Republicans in office, now we can start lowering taxes and killing people. In other words, the death penalty. Great. Well, well, no, killing a murderer is not killing people. It's executing a dangerous person who kills decent well, people. Well, ask him if he, if, he's so, uh, if, if he is so irritated at the prospect of people being killed, why doesn't he have the same strong feelings when uh, women are raped and innocent people are killed, which happens every day? Why isn't he out crying for them? Why doesn't he talk about how mean-spirited the murderers are? Well, because well, they, are they, they have their agenda, and you know Well, it. well their, their agenda is, you see, the murderers, to him, is not mean-spirited. The murderer has no choice. He is compelled right. to behave the way he does. He's compelled to murder because of how horrible our, our country is. Well, that's why... America the, makes him murder. And that's ahead. why the people with that philosophy have been thrown out of office, Jay. And uh, Lars Eric Nelson said, now the Republicans have to produce. Why didn't Lars Eric Nelson ask the Democrats to produce half of what Ronald Reagan produced in the 1980s? They don't have to produce. They just have to leave the American people alone to think the way they want to think. Right, Jay. That's what they hated about the 1980s, because America was allowed to operate the way that it was supposed to operate, and that's what they really disliked. Well, you know what I'm waiting for, John. John from Staten Island for political office. I'm not kidding. Borough president of Staten Island to start with. Uh, state assemblyman after that. A state senator. Who knows, someday maybe Governor John from Staten Island. Or Senator John from Staten Island. How about John and Jay for president and vice president? Or oh, maybe a talk show. What a ticket. Sounds like another one I know. You know of. something? I'd do a talk show with you. <laughs> maybe on our network show. Maybe, maybe on our national show. Yeah. Our national show. Yeah, to be, you know, to be a national Jay, you have to be bland. John and anything but that. John and Jay, coast to coast. <laughs> okay. Only you and I won't be smoking cigars. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Okay. On WABC, this is Jay Diamond. Good evening. I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight. Well, the ballots have been cast. The votes are tallied, and the people have spoken. Boo, 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 boo. No, 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 boo, no, boo, no, 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 please, please, no. It's been a long, hard road. We've traveled together, and I know it won't be easy for you. Boo, boo, no, but for, for just once, boo, no, I beg you, just, just show just a little of class. I know it's, it's not easy. I only just found out about the election results a few minutes ago. The news of the outcome was delivered to me in my dressing room backstage. It came to me like a gentle visit from the Grim Reaper. I'll never forget those big, heavy eyelids, those huge, dark, almost foreboding circles, and blank, hollow stare. A chill ran down my spine, and, and the thoughts of my own demise soon overtook my conscious mind. It came closer and closer, those dark eyes staring at me like the face of a, of a reanimated cadaver. Cadaver. Cadaver, cadaver, uh, corpse. That's when I realized it was only Marsha Kramer. She said, Governor Cuomo, George Pataki just won the election. Do you think it's fair? And that's when I knew it was all over. There's a lot of people I'd like to thank tonight. Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpman. I'll always hold a very special place in my heart for you. You were right, Jesse. Maybe if I'd denounced Cardinal O'Connor as a racist, things might have been different. Ross Perot, you were beautiful. New Jersey Governor Christine Todd Whitman, you, you almost did it for me. Was that Governor Whiteman? No, Whitman, you almost did it for me. And who could ever forget my tower of strength and inspiration, a man who stood at my side like Hannibal before the gates of Rome all these many years. Uh, he's been my powerful right arm. Of course, I'm talking about the most dynamic lieutenant governor in the memory of a history, our own Stanley Lundeen. Lundeen. Stanley Lundeen. You know who I mean, about five foot something, uh, little Mr. Potato Head glasses. He was, he was here a minute ago. Oh, come on, Stanley Lundin, he looks like Bobby Abrams with hair, no? And the hell with him, he, he really didn't do that much anyway. But most of all, I'd like to thank my lovely wife, Matilda, for her tireless effort and support. You know, Matilda wore a lot of different hats during this campaign. She's served as secretary, road manager, organizer. She's been everything. Uh, translator, why on any given day she'd marshal the troops like a LaGuardia, inspire the constituents like Bobby Kennedy, or play the race card like Sonny Carson. And I must say that for a relative novice, Matilda can race bait with the best of them. 
And as far as I'm concerned, who needs Hazel Jukes or Sister Soldier when you've got a Matilda Cuomo in your corner? Thank you, thank you. And, and last, but certainly not least, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the presidents, Bill and Hillary. I know and can safely say from the bottom of my heart that I, I wouldn't be standing here tonight if it hadn't been for their efforts. And I only wish they could be here tonight so I might express my gratitude in a more personal setting. And so I leave you, my dear friends, Gavon Elder, who said, old Svachims never die. They simply fake away. Goodbye. All right, uh, back on WABC, this is Jay Diamond. I believe it does mark a watershed, a sea change, in the way the American people think about themselves, and yes, the way they think about their enemies, internal as well as external. The tide of propaganda for the last 40 years has been on the side of the internal enemies of the United States. I have said, and not in jest, that I would love to see the resurrection of the House Committee on Un-American Activities, because it's my belief that America has been deluged since the abandonment of HUAC by millions and millions and millions of internal seditionists, people that detest this country. And they have, owing to a cozy relationship with a press corps who largely hates the country along with them, this cadre of millions of internal fifth columnists has been aided and abetted in disseminating a pernicious anti-American propaganda that has been accepted as the gospel truth for the last 40 years in the United States. The left-wing, hard-left press, and I don't say liberal, because I am a liberal. And I want to draw the distinction between a liberal who loves America, who has some ideas on how to, how to conduct public policy, as compared to a Stalinist, hard-left traitor, many of whom are in this man's government. And there is a difference between a hard-left Stalinist traitor, no matter where they are, in the government, in the Congress, in the press, on the radio, a difference between people like that and decent, uh, loyal Americans who love their country and love the people in this country, but who have a different view of public policy from people on the right. I believe there is such a thing as a person who has who values this country and its traditions and its heritage and its people, who, who can be a liberal. I do not hate liberals, and I tell you the truth, if this were 1933, I probably would be one. When I read The Grapes of Wrath, I'm with the Okies, not with the growers. If you want to impale me, you can impale me for that. But there is a difference between an America-loving liberal like Harry Truman or even Hubert Humphrey and a hard-left, treacherous, traitorous, anti-American Stalinist, no matter where they exist. Harry Truman was, was well rid of Henry Wallace in 1948. And Henry Wallace could not, could not own Harry Truman. He couldn't blackmail him. You have to appoint communists to the State Department for me to not break with the party. Harry Truman said, to hell with you, go away. I don't want you and your kind. And he was right to do it. But Harry Truman was a liberal, but he loved this country deeply. And I believe Hubert Humphrey loved this country deeply. But why in hell should I be in hock or influenced by people who, who, from the beginning, have a premise of hating this country? Why should I listen to their ideas on public policy? If somebody starts off with the idea that this country is fundamentally unjust, corrupt, invalid, all its institutions worthless and invalid, what else does that person have to say to me? I'm not interested in hearing from you. You're completely discredited in my view, no matter where you are, in the government, in the press, or on the radio. A person who hates this country and boasts about it is not somebody who has the best interest of the country at heart, so why am I supposed to listen to their imbecilic public policy prescriptions, no matter where they are? They are to be, they are to be banished. They have no influence on me. I can't take somebody seriously who from the outset hates this country. Why? Let me talk to people who say, gee, I have some good ideas about public policy. I think uh, it would be a good idea if we have a single-payer national health plan. Now, a lot of people would say, oh, that's terrible, the government taking over the blah, 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 blah. But I would listen to that person. I happen to think it's not a bad idea. If you're going to, if you're going to mess with it, then that was my idea of the way to mess with it. 
all or nothing at all. Not some jerry-built, stupid Hillary-built, in-secret contraption that doesn't allow you to go to the doctor that you want, when you want, where you want. But I'm getting beyond myself. The basic essential assumption that I must have before I listen to anybody and take their views seriously with respect to public policy in this country, I must be certain in my heart that they have the best interests of this country at heart, that they want the best for the people that I love, the American people. If I think they are, that the idea of America is anathema to them, if somebody comes on and tells me every day or writes every day that the idea of the United States of America is a corrupt idea, an evil idea, an intrinsically demonic, devilish idea that I hate, and I hate everything about these, these institutions that are fundamentally unjust. I hate the traditions, the history, the values, the heritage, the institutions of this land between the uh, Pacific and the Atlantic. Well then, fine, you have nothing to tell me because anything that you say will be directed against this country, not in far favor of it. And my basic fundamental assumption is that this is a good country, a just country, an equitable place, a fine place, a place that I revere, and a place and people to whom I am grateful. People who came before me that I love because of what they did, what they allowed my family to do, the haven that this place provided for the world. And even today, ladies and gentlemen, all these people who are on television shaking their fist, hating it, boasting of their hatred, their contempt for the bourgeois United States, where in blazes do they want to come? Where do they want to live to spew their poison? They want to live here. All those people, all those worthless lowlifes in Mexico trashing the McDonald's because Proposition 187 was passed, what are they really saying? Hey, we want to go to America, illegally. And when we hate America, this horrible place, because they don't want us to break the law and get in and steal from the American people. Many of whom are comprised by people who came legally from Mexico. So there's an irony in their protest and in their shenanigans and in their hatred for this country, a very, very bitter irony. The bottom line is, all these hard left-wing America haters can never answer this question. Tell me, if what you say about the deplorable state of our culture, politics, traditions, and history is true, why is it that people are clamoring to get in, crawling over dead bodies uh, each other to get in here, willing to sink in the Caribbean to get in here? If it's such a horrible place, why is it a magnet for everybody the world over? They cannot answer that. How come everybody here wants to come here with these terrible right-wingers like Rush Limbaugh, like Pat Buchanan, like Newt Gingrich? How come the lowlifes that trashed that McDonald's in opposition to the passage of 187? How come those people are crawling here, want to dig tunnels and sneak in on the back of trucks and die in airplanes to get in here to live where the horrible Newt Gingrich and Pat Buchanan and Rush Limbaugh live? How come? You can't answer that question. Because those people vote with their feet, you hard left Stalinist traitors, liars. What they tell you with their feet is a message that resounds north to the North Pole, to the South Pole, to the East, to the West. And what they say with their feet is a more eloquent speech than you'll ever hear Bill Clinton make. What they say with their feet is, God bless America, the land that I love no matter what I say. Because while I'm cursing America, while I'm deploring America, while I'm hating America, my feet are moving toward America. And they don't lie. So let's not confuse people who have a, a more activist uh, economic policy in mind for this country with hard left Stalinist traitors who in some great day in the future will be purged from our political culture by a resurgent House on american Activities Committee. And I'm going to write to Jesse Helms. I'm going to write to Pat Buchanan. I am going to write to Newt Gingrich. I'm going to write to Strom Thurmond, all the new America-loving committee chairmen, beseeching them to reinstate the House on american Activities Committee. On WABC, this is Jay Diamond. And you see, a, you see somebody, a little old lady, sitting in a doorway, talking to herself. And she has a cup in her hand. 
and you see her and you, you, you take pity on her, you want to help her, you walk over and you put in a buck or two. And you do that every day. And, and you do that for other people because you're decent and you feel for people and you have feelings and, and you, you can empathize with other human beings because you're not unattached. You feel some community, some communion with the world. And then suddenly another guy comes up to you growling, wearing a, a, a dirty, tattered army field jacket and a bandana. He starts insulting you and cursing your mother and threatening your children, telling you what he's going to do to you how angry he is, and then he sticks his hand up and says, hey, and I want 10 bucks. Well, you can kiss my arse. You see? So there are people, ladies and gentlemen, who have a, a, an empathy for humanity. There are people who actually have a sense of social justice, whose instincts, whose, whose fundamental instincts are to help people and to share and to make life better for everybody who are so offended by being insulted that they have reacted to it, like I have, and said, okay, you want to insult me? I am a nice person, and I care about other people, but I'll be goddamned if I'm going to take your, sh your shale any longer. Now you're on your own. I started off as somebody who wanted to help you. I extended my hand, and all you did was insult me and curse out my family, my heritage, my institutions. Thanks, but no thanks. So you're on your own. And I think that's what the electorate did, and I did it too, and that's the reason. We responded emotionally because we've been trashed long enough when we all we were doing was trying to be nice. On WABC, this is Jay Diamond from New Jersey and all over 2014. Now, what do we have now? Uh, I'm John. I wish I had time to read some of his direct quotes here. I really, uh, I'd love to, but I just don't have the time. So many people are on the phone right now. And uh, maybe I'll read a little bit later. Let me read a little bit. This is uh, from his stump speech. And then later, I'll read you some of his, his reflections that were uh, repeated on C-SPAN today. And, um, well, let me go. This was in his stump speech as he was campaigning. Now, let me be quite direct about this. We have, I think, a crisis of the system at two levels. One level is that we can't afford the current structure of government unless we were to massively raise taxes and crush the private sector. The other problem you have is the current structure of government doesn't work. So you're paying too much for a system that's destructive. The problem in Washington, and those of you who might have seen Tim Russert go at me on Meet the Press will appreciate where we're at. The problem in Washington is that they start with an assumption. This government cannot be changed. Therefore, how do we get more out of the American people? And they either get more out of the American people by not sending them back their own money, cutting entitlements, cutting Social Security, or we get more out of them by raising taxes. I start from a totally different perspective, and I want to share with you very candidly and get your reaction to it, because this is at the heart of what I, where I need your advice and I need your counsel. Because getting this country back on the right track is a heck of a lot bigger job than one member of Congress or one president or even an entire party. This is a job that is going to require all 260 million Americans to take some serious responsibility for their future. We have to recognize that American exceptionalism is real, that American civilization is the most unique civilization in history, that we bring more people of more ethnic backgrounds together to pursue happiness with greater opportunity than any civilization in the history of the world. And we just don't say that candid. Haitians have more to learn from America than Americans have to learn from Haitians. The same is true of Bosnia. As far as I'm concerned, this counterculture notion, this politically correct notion that, quote, oh, gee, we shouldn't make any value judgments, that's silly. The Declaration of Independence is a value judgment. It says we're endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, among them our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, if you think about that, it's the most radical statement of humanness in history. It says each of you is endowed by God, not by the state, not by government, not by the liberals, not by bureaucracy, not by lawyers, by God. And therefore, by the way, when you rape somebody, you're raping somebody who's been endowed by God. If you kill somebody, you're killing somebody who's been endowed by God. That's why the whole sense of safety is at the center of the American experience. But so is a sense of work. If you're not working, you are wasting something which has been endowed. So we've got to go back, I think, and have the moral courage to say, yeah, we're going to teach people to be American. We're going to teach people the values of work. We're going to teach people the systems that work. And we're going to renew the 300-year commitment to human opportunity. Lastly, 
we have to recognize that the political class has failed. As George Will says brilliantly in a column, the objective fact is the political class across this country, from city council to county commission to state government to the federal government, has failed to be responsible to people the way it needs to be and that we are going to have to literally go and look at from the ground up how to make it more open. You see it beginning to happen. City councils that are on local cable access is a good step. We're going to insist that the rules be changed such that if you file a bill or a conference report in Washington in print, you also have to file the conference report electronically so that at the second, anybody in the country you, who wants to can get a copy of it. And you begin to change the whole dynamics so insiders no longer have any special advantage. That man is a very insightful person. Not only is he knowledgeable on facts, but he understands the way people work, the way institutions mutate, and he understands the difference, and this is the key. Newt Gingrich understands the difference between good and evil, between right and wrong, and he understands that those differences have become obscured through 40 years of a counterculture imposed on the American people by left-wing elites and anarchists and haters of this country that says, well, no, actually anything that's bad isn't really bad. Uh, anything that's, that you say is bad is merely a result of the horrible America. So that anybody who's a career criminal, for example, or who has career antisocial tendencies and actions isn't really uh, committing a bad act. He's just responding to an evil system. He knows it's BS, and now you do too. Hello, Paul, this is Jay Diamond on the... Uh, hi, Jay. Hi. Hey, Jay. Yeah. Uh, Whenever uh, an effective spokesman comes along that represents the views of conservatives or the right and interrupts the plans for anarchy of the left, that person becomes the new target of desperate, vicious attacks and downright lies from the left. It started with Joe McCarthy and then uh, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, Dan Quayle, Oliver North, and uh, Rudy Giuliani, who addresses quality of life issues. And now, in their desperation, their latest hysterical attack is uh, addressed to Newt Ingridge. And on a local level, you, Bob, and Rush, and anyone else who's effective in exposing their bankrupt philosophy. And whenever things don't go the way the lefties would like them to, Jay, they always predict the worst case scenario to frighten people. It doesn't work anymore, Jay. The information out there is too vast, and that's what helped bring down the communists in Eastern Europe people found out what the real truth was. And you know, Jay, you can't believe anything liberals and the left ever write or say, because they will tell a blatant lie in the hopes that enough people will believe it and repeat the lie over and over. Remember during the war in the Middle East, Jay, the liberals uh, claimed that foreign student from uh, Italy, Martin Lokal, was a uh, drummed out of the United States by the right wing in this country because he refused to wear the American flag on his uniform. Well, the students who ran the school newspaper that that student went to, uh, the school that he went to, they investigated uh, this story and they found out that Martin Lokar was looking for a face-saving excuse to leave the United States to join the Italian Pro Basketball League because he knew he wasn't going to make it in the pros here. Uh -huh. So this is why you can never believe these lying skunks. And Jay, I heard uh, a certain uh, person say on another talk show that it costs more money to execute a, uh, a criminal because, uh, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you leave them in jail, it'll call less, cost less. You know why it costs more to execute somebody? Because the ACLU and all the left-wing groups here who stall off the execution cost state yeah. millions of dollars. But, but John, so what? So it costs more to uh, execute somebody. So what? That's money well worth spending. I believe well, that. First of all, they deserve to be executed. Money isn't everything. I, I always have said that. I, I, I really think it's very ignoble to uh, reduce everything to dollars and cents. Society has a, a great benefit that exceeds its value in dollars when a murderer is executed. Yeah, they'll be the first ones that'll tell you, how could you put a price on life? Besides, I'll, I'll donate some of my salary to the executions to make <laughs> it easier for them to happen. Yeah, well, you know, Jay, um, 
the, uh, the, the, the thing that's going on with Mexico. Just one more thing. I want to hear what you say about Mexico. But if, if you're really opposed to executions, then you should tell all those people who are so against executing people that the way to save money from executions is to persuade persuade their friends not to murder anybody. Well, that's true. Very Critical. simple. I know it's a too high a price to pay. I mean, wait, you mean to stop the executions, we have to stop murdering? No, no, I, 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 it's unreasonable. <laughs> no, no, we have to continue. No, we want our right to murder, and we also don't want to be punished. Oh, yeah. that's true. You should, that's true. After all, the only reason you're murdering is because this country stinks. Yeah, well, of course. That's, 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 that's the, so there's a, it's not as if you were murdering without a good reason. I'm right. sorry, John, about Mexico. No, it, uh, to follow up on... It's a good place saying. to grow melons. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I, you know, I know one caller said today to follow up on what you were saying, I don't want to see people die. Why not if they murdered somebody? I want to see them croak. I'll pull the trigger <laughs> or the, the switch. And they, they talked about uh, the, um, uh, the death penalty being uh, disproportionately applied. Yeah, it is against white people, even though they commit one-tenth of the amount of uh, murders that blacks commit. But as far as these uh, skunks in, uh, in Mexico, you know, Jay, what the left in this country couldn't accomplish militarily, they're accomplishing uh, by doing a, a, lo a load of other things, and one of them is to uh, encourage uh, illegal immigration to leech off the American taxpayer and uh, go, you know, there's a lot more riots going on in Los Angeles now. No, I didn't more know. What's going on? Right now? Yeah, I heard uh, some reports. I've got to look into it further, but there is a lot more trouble going on. But there are left-wing groups in Mexico encouraging Mexicans to annex the United States. I wish they'd try to do that. Yeah. I wish they'd try to do that. Remember how the Israelis captured the West Bank. They were invaded by Jordan. Yeah. So if perhaps yeah. if Mexico invades the United States, uh, I have a feeling even with Bill Clinton as president, we could prevail in that encounter, and maybe we could just... Uh, we could take over all of Mexico, and then what we could do is we could, all those Mexicans wouldn't have to come here anymore. They could stay home, and, and we take care of them in Mexico. Well, we should occupy that country because it is the vehicle for everything illegal that's destroying the United States. Uh, drugs, criminals, illegal immigration. They are not our friendly neighbor to the south. They are an enemy. And even the president of Mexico said that he believes that Mexicans are co-citizens of the United States. And the former president of Mexico said that if we invaded Cuba, he would side with Castro against the United States. But melons, John, they grow those melons there. You know? <laughs> okay. I don't like melons. Uh, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. On WAB, Carol was at her work at the button plant where she, she had a computer screen. And, I don't know, she was... She was perturbed with Bob for one or another reason, but their colloquy was, I thought, the most amusing thing I'd heard on the radio in many and many a day. In fact, I think I'm going to take that tape home. Do we have that? I'd like to, I would like that for my own collection, Michael. Do you recall the time she appeared? It had to have been after five, because Mr. Diamond did not awaken today until about, about 4.45. All right, wait. Uh, and then there was a better one. It was even, a, a, that was a long exchange Bob had with Carol. He, he kept her around dangling for a long time, and it really was beautiful interplay. It was, I thought it was very, very artfully crafted by, by Bob. But then there was a, another call. I don't remember the guy's name, but he called up, and, uh, well, I don't want to be cruel, but it was the funniest thing I've ever heard. He, he called up, Republican guy, Bob, um, uh, <laughs> the guy had just gotten out of Gavon school, and uh, he called Bob up, and he said he's really glad we have... Uh, this new election here with the House and the Congress. And how long do you think we'll be able to, it'll, how long do you think it'll be before the Republicans can fix up the uh, fiscal structure? And Bob said, well, what do you mean by the fiscal structure? I don't know what you, what you mean by that. What is the fiscal structure? And the, uh, the guys go, you know, Bob, you know, you know uh, the, the, the interest rates, you know, Bob, I'm only getting about, you know, three, four percent, you know, three percent on my bank. And, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, like 15 years ago, you know, I was getting 18, 20 percent, and that's what I want. You want 18, 20 percent? Well, don't you realize that if you're, if you're getting 18 to 20 percent, that uh, the to borrow money also uh, means a exorbitant interest rates. You don't. Uh, what, what, what do you mean by? <laughs> There's a guy who wanted to go back to 18, 20 percent interest rates that we had under under Jimmy Carter, because it's, of course, convenient for him
to accrue that kind of interest <laughs> when, his, <laughs> when, his, <laughs> when his money is in the bank. But uh, he didn't realize that it also costs borrowers 20% when they want to expand their business or when you want a mortgage. So in my view, that was a rather a funny call. What? Because Speaker Gingrich is the new demon. He has come to the top of the shale list of those who hate this country. And yes, this is what I was getting to at the beginning. I, sometimes you have so much on your mind that you lose track. Instead of talking about people of the left and people of the right, instead of talking about conservatives and talking about liberals, I think what it all comes down to, fundamentally, what it re people really are talking about here in the divide with which we're faced in this country is there are some people who feel comfortable with the idea of America, who have a, an emotional attachment to the idea of America the way we have known it, the way we've experienced it, and the way people over 40 have been taught about it. There are people who like the country. There are people who feel a devotion to the country. Not everybody enlisted in the army and fought and got, those are special people, but most people, most people feel comfortable that they're Americans. They feel good about being an American. They feel prideful in being an American. Most people do. However, other people, ladies and gentlemen, simply detest this country and its institutions. They hate the country. So rather than talk about the left or talk about the right, because I think there are people of the left who really like the country, and I think there have been people like that. I don't think Allard Lowenstein hated the United States of America. I don't think that Bill Buckley would have been the principal speaker at his funeral when he was shot by that guy if Bill Buckley thought that Allard Lowenstein deep down hated this country. He didn't. There are other people of the... I don't think Teddy Kennedy hates the United States. I don't think he detests this country. I don't think Hubert Hun Humphrey hated this country. Why, uh, why do people call Peter Call? I see it on the screen. Maybe the screen, I shouldn't even look at it when I'm doing the monologue. He wants to talk about Les Payne, who I do want to address a little later. And uh, I guess he chickened out, so uh, you're, you're not worth it, Peter. Anyway, let me get back to, to what I was talking about. So it's really, it doesn't come to the point, to the heart of the matter, when you talk about people of the left or the right, conservatives or, or liberals. I think fundamentally... What so I think the real cultural divide here is between people who like this country, its institutions, and the people who live here, and people who loathe it from the bottom of their heart, resent it, fear it, and hate this country and its institutions. And I think that's how I'm going to try to frame the debate in the next few months however long that I'm on the radio here or any place else. It really is a fight between people who love this country, people who like this country, people who are comfortable with the idea, notions, fundamental institutions and values and credo of this country, and people who just detest this country in all of its cultural, social, and political manifestations. And you'll forgive me, but when I see people who do detest this country and it's all its cultural, political, and social manifestations, I have a very strong resentment toward them because I'm very grateful to this country. I don't know what would have happened. My, my, uh, my parents, my grandma, oh, my, grand, my great-grandparents emigrated. I don't know, where would I be if I were still in Europe? I might be in a gas chamber. I might be a peasant on the land. I don't think so. I think I'm pretty independent-minded, but maybe not. I don't know, am I responsible for my, the way I think, the way I view the world? Or is America and its institutions responsible for the way I, I view the world? I like to think that I am, however independent I am, whatever kind of analytical uh, acumen that I have to look at life and size up life and history is a byproduct, is a consequence of my family having come to America years and years and years ago. So I'm profoundly grateful for this country because had I not been born here, I would have been a different Jay Diamond. I would not be me. And there, I wouldn't know myself. So I am a product for better, some might say for worse, for having been brought up in a country that I really love, that I like. I like the with room, with room. I feel better than one of those little uh, wasted ballerina tutus that those European guys wear. I feel better in an American car, big, comfortable with less gadgetry than those European contraptions that look like they're some child's fire truck. So I guess, for better or worse, I am fated my whole life to be an American and to prefer American values. 
And so I get a little angry when I see people whom I know detest the country. Just detest it. There, let's face it, there are just people who are intractable in their belief that this is an oppressive, vicious, racist, bourgeois, capitalist society, and they loathe it, and they would love it. They would love it, love to see it turn completely around. I resent them, because I think they have, a, they have an unreal view. They are filtering their conception of this country through their own innate prejudice, and in my view, mental illness. And I honestly believe that the, the millions of internal saboteurs and fifth columnists who, who, in the words of Larry Hoover, the president of the Gangster Disciple Nation, constitute his army, and those are his words, not mine, the millions of, of uh, agitprop provocateurs, saboteurs, traitors, fifth columnists, who currently infest this country and revile its institutions based on their own ignorance and ineptitude, I think that, that these people are essentially victims of mental illness. Yes, I do believe that two generations of Americans have suffered mental illness, mass neurosis bordering on psychosis in many instances, ladies and gentlemen, because they have been propagandized by professional America haters into loathing the venerable institutions, political, social, and economic, and cultural, that comprise what I believe to be America. And that is why I and Speaker Gingrich are their implacable foe. And he, more than any other leader, even on the right, understands the problem, understands the crucial point we're at in our history. Ladies and gentlemen, he understands the culture war better even than the great Pat Buchanan because he singles out the counterculture for blame, and that is 100% true. The counterculture, whether they're hippies or beatniks or posers or phony artists or inflammatory phony political radicals who just want to get girls in college and assume a political pose to that end, those people, ladies and gentlemen, are, are people who, who hate this country, as I say, and its institutions. That's what I think of when I talk about, when he talks about the counterculture. That's my conception, my definition of the counterculture. All those people and institutions who, who take it as their premise that this country is intrinsically evil, oppressive, racist, etc., 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 fill in whatever negative attitude that you have, but that's what I regard to be the, the counterculture. People who do not have the best interests of their country at heart. And I think largely that's because they've been taught very, very uh, venal and corrupt ideas. They have been propagandized by people who, from the beginning, from the outset, have yearned for the destruction of what America means to me and many of my countrymen. And so I think a lot of what the troubles we have now are this neurotic, bordering on psychotic counterculture that Gingrich alone identifies, and he is correct, because a lot of the problem in America's inner cities are, in my view, not problems of, of violence, not problems in, I mean, they, that, those are manifestations, the violence are, are manifestations. Uh, not problems of a lack of intelligence, but problems of emotional sickness. And I'm not kidding when I talk about uh, a head core, trained psychotherapists, real psychotherapists, not the advisors that masquerade as psychotherapists. That's something I'll talk, these gurus who tell women what boyfriends to have and give them advice on their day-to-day. -day. That's, that's bullshit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about mental health practitioners who understand but a lot of the problems that people have in dealing with day-to-day -day life, in, in dealing with adulthood, stems from neurosis and or, in many instances, such as Larry Hoover and gangs, psychosis, a psychotic, pathological way of life, way of looking at the world that is taught by the counterculture as the normal way to view life. So I think we have a, a critical mental health problem in this country, and unlike certain Republicans or certain conservatives, I would be willing to tax people to pay for well-trained mental health workers to fan out in our inner cities and in many other areas as well to deprogram people from the cult of America hatred that they have been propagandized with for two generations. I think, ladies and gentlemen, what we have essentially, the problem that we have in many areas in this country throughout our culture is the fact that many people simply have been told that to deal, for them to be, deal with life as an adult is an insult to them, somehow unfair. Life is very difficult. It's difficult for me and it's difficult for you. The difficulty in life is not limited to people that live in housing projects. It's difficult for everybody. Very few people have a life that's constantly a clear horizon. 
I myself have emotional difficulties. I'm confessing to you, I force myself to deal with life every day, sometimes not that successfully. But I have the tendency, and this is why I understand it, to be a, to be a child instead of an adult. I would love to be able to do whatever I want every day, to get a check in the mail, and never have to be frustrated in anything. But that's essentially what a two-year-old boy wants. And somebody has to deprogram people who have been told by anarchists who hate this country, people who detest this country, that anybody who tells you to act like an adult, to take responsibility, and to be an adult, is somehow uh, acting in a way contrary to your better interests. Bull shale. It's always hard to be an adult, ladies and gentlemen. In the moment, this minute, when you want to stay around and take crack, or shoot up in heroin, or, or impregnate an 11-year-old girl, yes, you're going to be frustrated from that. If you're an adult...